Now, uh, will the speakers come here? And now you can ask questions. Okay. We'll have uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we're sorry that uh, Quillen had to leave. Yes. So, who has the first question? Peter, I tell us you wanted. Well, I had one question that got answered. Oh, but, not to, uh, not I have to the group. Question. Go ahead. And you're you're the questions. question man. I have two questions. Go ahead. Uh, Quick. Thank you, Julie. Uh, whatever uh, the, the the keynote speaker at the that we heard, uh, his name was uh, Joseph. Joseph. Yeah, Joseph. Mr. Joseph. I was wondering, just out of curiosity, whatever happened to him, because apparently he was not at the second convocation uh, at Ciola held. Whatever happened to Mr. Joseph? And did he pass on, or what does what was his role? Does anybody remember anything about him? ran into him uh, several times at various FOIA functions afterwards. And he was, uh, he's from Toledo, and his business was putting on conventions and conferences and dances. That was his business. Mm. And then I lost touch. I think he moved away from Toledo, and my wife moved away from Toledo, so I didn't go up there anymore, and I lost contact with him. But he was a dynamic, he'd make a great He was good, and he was energetic, and but he didn't hog the limelight. Mm -hmm. He let others get involved. He gave a very powerful speech. Oh, yeah. did. Other question, Peter, quick. I had a, uh, just out of curiosity, all the material that's been gathered here, thanks to you, sir, uh, uh, and a lot of it's archival. It's what's where is it going to be maintained? And I was wondering if it, uh, you know, OCL has its, its uh, archive at uh, DePaul University in Chicago, which is probably the largest collection of things like that. And if you haven't got another home for it, I would think that, uh, I would like to suggest that you might consider that place because the librarian at DePaul is very interested in this kind of material. And uh, they have their kind of interest, a Catholic university, but they have taken the approach of, uh, looking for organizations like OCL and perhaps what CELA might have uh, 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 matured into, but which is also there, which were lay organizations which were pr provocative within the hierarchy of their particular churches. The Brannigan Brothers, for example, all of their materials are kept there and other people like that. So I think that would be a good place to go because it's an important part of not only, it's an important part of the lay movement in the Orthodox Church, which is not necessarily acknowledged by the hierarchy as playing an important role, except to pester them. <laughs> well, the, the material, anything that you saw with the blue seal is presently archived and maintained in, in climate controlled conditions in the archives of the Romanian Orthodox Episcopate of the, OC, of the OCA and also of the Romanian American Heritage Center which is an institution right. on the same grounds as the headquarters of the Romanian Episcopate. Right. But I'm in complete agreement. I, I would love to see this material uh, broadcast as far as it can be and to become part, at least, of the general consciousness of the American church. Uh, there is a little bit of an issue, and I have attempted, but neither Quaylen Nassar nor I have been able to speak with the upper management at KDKA, which I understand is the copyright owner of the 1977 video. And if you have time this afternoon, I'd be willing to stay and play that video. It oh, is yes. the only video we have, and it is very impressive. It's very lovely. Um, my goal, ultimately, but I would probably need two or three other people to work with, would be to go through the other archdiocesan archives, locate everything, the amount of material is voluminous. Mm -hmm. I have probably 10 or 15 of the 50, 60 meetings of CO that they met twice a year during their life, during the lifespan. So I would be extremely happy to share any of the information with anybody. The audio, now my research and the, if there are any IP lawyers in the international, intellectual property lawyers in the audience, you, 
you could fill me in, but I think 1963 is probably at this point, because the patent law and the, and the copyright law changed, maybe either public domain or we could probably get under us a, a, a more liberal fair use doctrine. Uh, plus we're a church, what the heck. Um, you know, if we try to fill theaters and sell tickets at 25 bucks a head, it might be a problem. But we would want to use this for building up of the church and being more active. So I, I'd be very happy. You know, uh, I've been involved with, uh, I think we have 24 of the by Aroy, hosted by the FROC, you know. Um, well, I, I rep was there representing the FROC, um, others representing Aroy and, and UOL and, and all the rest of them. The Greeks were, were uh, intermittently represented. Um, Goya, was not, Goya was not horribly involved. Um, in the leadership of Ciola. They, they had a nominal membership in Ciola. They were, they were involved, um, but they were never uh, in, in, in leadership roles, at least during, during my tenure uh, with Ciola. They were represented, but never took an active leadership role. Yeah. They were very ethnocentric. No, by that time, <laughs> was not the same. By that yeah, time, was not the same organization. Right. And, and Jim had mentioned that to me. It wasn't the same organization. It diametrically changed in the late 60s. And I don't know whether it was because of Kent State, whether they thought that American kids were just a bunch of, you know, wild-eyed and, you know, raging hormones. Right. I don't, I, there's a natural, to be as kind as I can, to those in legitimate authority, I think there's a natural fear of a movement getting out of hand. And even more so when you're, and you know, the more I listened to Archbishop Yakubos, especially when I listened to him, you know, this was after, immediately after, Archbishop was corrected, immediately after Vatican II, threw the baby out with the bathwater. At least, you know, we're orthodox, we think that. So there's a, a fear, there's a, you know, get rid of this, get rid of the, you know, Submit. So, I think I think Michael referred to the canonical issue that he alluded. He came out and said it. I felt because I was putting it in print that it it might be a little bit more. The problem, it was the issue of the Ukrainians, and keep in mind, in 19, well, no, our, our Romanians issue was resolved by 1963. It, it's just, it's the canonical issue. Are you, it's just like today. Just like today. Is this on tape? Why, well, I've said this before. I've said it in my articles. And you know what I really love, and I'm, this is just an aside, but it could be on tape. At no point did my archbishop ask me censor my probe. This, he saw this for the first time. And I can't tell you, you know, I believe that this is the feeling that these people had in 63, 77, that uh, you feel trusted, you feel that you self-censor, but you're, it's not in a bad way. I was never asked to see this, pr uh, this presentation at all until I turned it on the show. So that's what we grew up with but it was a big issue, and there was another issue, and again, our, uh, Bishop Valerian Trifa, in his three-page or four-page letter, referred to it, and I don't know the whole story. Maybe somebody can, maybe Jimmy can fill me in. Part of the stage in 63 had to be three inches higher than the rest. 
I don't. I, 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 you know, in the law we say I demur. I <laughs> demur. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that the, the um, I'm not sure that 1963 there was a canonical issue. That happened in '77 with the with the Ukrainian uh, metropolitan who was not considered canonical by the rest of the rest of the Orthodox world. And uh, so, um, but UOL was very much an important integral part of Ciola, and so we had to get through that and figure out a way uh, if. if Paul Mistislav was not going to be allowed on that stage, UOL, UOL was not going to be involved in, in, in that festival. So we had, to, we had to work through that and we eventually did. Another question? I have a question. Back in 1963 at the first Ciola meeting, uh, there was obviously a lot of publicity given to it by the uh, United States government, including the letter from Kennedy and the telegram and so on and so forth. Do you have any feeling that uh, that was in that meeting was in some subtle way encouraged as part of the uh, official American policy toward Eastern Europe and trying to, to convince them that here was a large group of Orthodox people in America that could express their religious freedom as opposed to the conditions they lived in? Because you said everything was broadcast to Eastern Europe so that Obviously, there, there was an intent to get that message across. Do you have any feeling that that was apparent at all at the time? No. I, I knew they were trying to do it, but the mechanics of it, uh, I don't know. Uh, Archbishop Jock was kind of took some control over it. And whether he did it, he influenced or not, I don't know. Okay. <coughs> but there may have been some subtle kind of influence. Yeah, it could have been very well been. Uh -huh. Okay, in the same context, how was publicity handled for 63 and 77? It's obvious in order to get that many people to come, it had to become generally known. How was publicity handled? Well, can I speak for 63? Yeah. Um, every, uh, for the, for the, from the angle of the Goya, once the program was set and everybody was in agreement, uh, beginning with our resolutions in 1961 at the actual conference, every chapter agreed to finance to pay for the, uh, for the cost of holding the Ciola Festival. Every district agreed to finance their share. The Ciola Committee gave every group, okay, the Greeks are going to have to owe so much, uh, the Russians so much, et cetera, et cetera. And they all agree, and they went back to the chapters. So every chapter had a hand. They knew we were being, we were paying for this money. So, okay, this must be important. Let's go see what it's like. I know from Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati and Middletown, we had 15 people coming. They, uh, they were uh, six delegates and alternates, and the rest were observers, but they all stayed for the Ciola Festival. I know Dayton did the same thing. So we all felt we had an interest in it because we helped pay for it. So e each Goya chapter actually contributed funds and identified People. delegates to come. Yes, well, but they had yes. their conventions there. The chapter, same, same allowed for everybody else. Yeah, it chap er, each chapter did and each district did. Uh, George just made the point that they all had their conventions well, there. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 those people were going to be there because of all the work that they did to bring the, their annual convention. See, the Goya convention used to have, be huge. I mean, I don't know how many people would come to a, a Goya convention in those years, Jim. Eight to eight hundred to a thousand yeah. people. Yeah. Right. Not counting visitors that maybe just drop in for a day or two. Well, they, they were big things. Girls. Well, in addition to the, the business meetings, they had socials, they had dances. I mean, there right. were people coming from all over the country, right. like they go to y'all conventions or yeah, the conventions, just to meet each other. That's right. It so all these all these organizations had their conventions synchronized, and as right. a result, they uh, could be easily. Goya finished theirs <coughs> the day before Labor Day. I think the Russians were starting that Saturday, and uh, I know that the Syrians were somewhere in there, but I can't remember. 